morning everybody, good morning, it's JPR, and welcome back to another video. One of my favorite things about Pokemon is how surprisingly deep some of its features run. Some are so well hidden that they went unnoticed by thousands, sometimes even millions of players. In appreciation of that, in today's video I'll be going over some of the neater, obscure features from every generation. Let's get started. So, what if I told you that you could actually shiny hunt in a generation where shiny Pokemon don't even exist? Of course, I'm talking about Gen 1 on the original Game Boy, where color wasn't even a thing yet. Wow, that might have been the most boomer thing I've ever said. Anyway, it's kind of complicated, but to make a long story short, basically, if you encounter a Pokemon with a specific combination of stats, known as determinant values, or DVs for short, then the Pokemon will be displayed as a shiny when transferred to Gen 2. And if you're wondering, yes, DVs were basically the Gen 1 and Gen 2 equivalent of modern day IVs. When most Pokemon get to level 50, you should be able to take a look at their stats and calculate their DVs to determine whether or not they have the proper numbers to be deemed as shiny. Because of this, shiny hunting in Gen 1 works best when soft resetting for the higher leveled legendary Pokemon. Although another reason for this would be that the regular encounters in the grass, caves, and surfing are all unhuntable which basically just leaves the starters, Snorlax, Eevee, the Game Corner prizes, and fishing encounters as the only things that have a chance to be shiny. But again, you'll probably have to level up most of these in order to tell, so it's just most efficient to go for the legendary birds or Mewtwo. And for the record, this feature not only works when transferring Pokemon to Gen 2, but also works when sending them to Gen 7 or to Pokemon Bank if you're playing on the 3DS Virtual Console. And as a little bonus feature, in Pokemon Yellow, if your partner Pikachu knows the move Thunderbolt or Thunder, then it will be able to briefly light up a pitch black cave like the Rock Tunnel, albeit only for a few short seconds. It may not be as efficient as actually having the HM for Flash, but you do get to save a move slot at the cost of experiencing extreme epilepsy. If you ask the average Pokemon fan when was the global trading feature first implemented, they would probably answer with Gen 4, specifically Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. But the truth is, this was first available in Pokemon Crystal. Japanese version only. Sorry for those of you who rushed to check your cartridges to verify that. Yes, the Japanese version of Pokemon Crystal featured numerous upgrades related to wireless communication that sadly did not make it overseas. Though it didn't have anything to do with the actual cartridge, it was more due to the fact that the Mobile Game Boy Adapter and Mobile System GB, two peripheral devices for the Game Boy Color, were never released outside Japan. Basically, these peripherals allow you to plug your Game Boy Color into your cell phone, which uh, weren't exactly all that compact back then, and then you could use that to connect to the internet. Although a few Game Boy Color titles were compatible with these devices, the only title that used them to any major degree of success was Pokemon Crystal. And even then, that presents a glaring problem, as Pokemon is primarily a game focused at young children, who certainly didn't own cell phones back in 2001. So, as a result, the thing flopped pretty hard, only selling roughly 80,000 copies before getting quickly discontinued. Nonetheless, Pokemon Crystal came packed with features exclusive to these devices. First and foremost, the mobile system GB allowed players to download the GS ball to their games and later catch Celebi, if you're wondering how that was handled. Secondly, there's the aforementioned international trading. Well, it would have been international if things had worked out better. Here's how Goldenrod City appears in International Crystal, and this is Goldenrod City in Japanese Crystal. Aside from a few aesthetic differences, you should notice that the Pokemon Center has been replaced by the PCC, or Pokemon Communication Center. This building would contain a number of features similar to those that would later appear in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. First, there's the Mobile List, which, like the Pal Pad from Gen 4, is a contact list of the friends that you've played with. Next, there's the Mobile Stadium, which allows players to participate in 10 minute long Wi-Fi battles, as if the 20 minute timer in Pokemon Sword and Shield wasn't a bad enough idea. And finally, the Trade Corner, which essentially functions like a stripped down GTS. You could deposit a Pokemon and then request for another, and thus, an entire generation of trolls learned how to ask for a Lugia level 9 and under. As an added bit of Johto lore, an NPC inside the communication center theorizes that the internet signal sent out from the building may have caused the sudden appearance of Unknown in the Ruins of Elf. The PCC would later be replaced by the Global Terminal in Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Lastly, in Japanese Crystal, the Daycare Man would give the player an egg ticket, which could be exchanged at the trade corner for the Odd Egg, which has a 50% chance of hatching into a shiny random baby Pokemon. In Localized Crystal, since the trade corner doesn't exist, the Daycare Man just gives you the egg himself, and it only has a 14% chance to hatch into a shiny. Thanks for buying our game, here's a free slap in the face. Honestly though, these features were really ambitious for only being Generation 2. It's a shame that so few people know about them though. 
The Pokemon Crystal Wi-Fi features, even in Japan, will always be remembered as one of the more obscure features. Well, actually, I guess they won't be remembered at all. So, on a slightly less remarkable note, and admittedly I'm cheating on this one because this feature was also in Gens 1 and 2, but in Generation 3 you could use the move Cut in the overworld to not just remove small trees, but also cut down the tall grass that wild Pokemon live in. In fact, you could clear entire areas if you wanted to, making it entirely possible to play through most of the game without ever encountering a wild Pokemon. I once tried this myself by landscaping the entire berry forest in Pokemon Fire Red. That was a good waste of an hour. Yeah, it's sadly not the most efficient feature in the world, as you basically have to open your menu, go to your party, select the Pokemon, select cut, watch the cutscene, walk forward two steps, reopen the menu, and do it all over again. If I had to guess, the developers probably watched someone do this and thought to themselves, for the love of god, just buy a repel, and then remove the feature entirely in Gen 4. But wait, funnily enough, in Pokemon Emerald, there's another layer to this obscure feature, that being the Pokemon with the ability Hypercutter will cut a wider radius of grass than regular Pokemon. Why do they put so much effort into this? It's basically a useless feature. Alright, so Gen 4 ought to be a little more interesting, seeing as how this generation introduced a ton of new features. A lot of these later became mainstays in the core series, but we may have forgotten a few of the weirder ones. First is the dual slot feature, something you may remember from my initial video on the Diamond and Pearl remakes. Basically, this feature took advantage of the Nintendo DS's ability to have a DS card and a Game Boy Advance cartridge inserted at the same time. Primarily, the dual slot is remembered for allowing trainers to transfer Pokemon up from Gen 3 to Gen 4 through a PAL Park, but depending on the game inserted, a new Pokemon will be added to the random encounter list in whichever area you are exploring. For instance, if you had Pokemon Fire Red inserted, you could catch Growlithe on the game's first route, Route 201. If you had Ruby inserted, then Solrock would appear at the three Sinnoh Lakes, but it would be Lunatone instead if you had Sapphire. And if you had any cartridge at all inserted, you could make Gengar appear at the old Chateau. In total, there are about 30 different Pokemon that you can encounter using this method. The only drawback is this method is only usable after obtaining the National Pokedex, which is why I really hope these dual slot Pokemon are just integrated to the main decks in the upcoming remakes. And furthermore, the dual slot feature was also occasionally used as a method to obtain event Pokemon without using Wi-Fi as you could obtain Pokemon through Mystery Gift just by plugging one of these special cartridges into the lower slot. To my knowledge, this was never used outside of Japan, though. Speaking of Mystery Gift, you will remember that you actually had to unlock the feature manually in Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. The way to do this was to go to Jubilife TV, talk to the TV producer, and answer his questions with the fill-ins, everyone happy, and Wi-Fi connection. I don't know how you were supposed to know this without looking it up or buying one of those guides from GameStop for an absurd amount of money. It just seems like a weird feature to gatekeep. Speaking of unlocking things, we gotta discuss the difficulty settings in Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. Yes, believe it or not, Game Freak did at one point attempt to make difficulty settings. At one point. Unfortunately, you could only unlock these settings through the most convoluted process of all time. First of all, you'd have to play and beat Pokemon Black 2 to obtain the key that unlocks challenge mode. Then, if you were a friendless loser, you'd have to grab a second DS and use that to send the challenge mode key over to your other cartridge so you could actually play through the game on challenge mode from the beginning like you're supposed to do. Or if you're playing White 2, you instead unlock easy mode after beating the game, which makes no sense whatsoever because evidently the game needed to be easier, otherwise you wouldn't have beaten the champion. Oh wait, you did. It's like passing calculus and then the school is like, wow, that was tough, now you're gonna take pre-calculus. Like, no, this is not the way that things are supposed to work. The key system could also be used to unlock different ruins for Regiice and Registeel inside the Clay Tunnel, and even swap Black City and White Forest between versions, which, while not as egregiously offensive as the difficulty settings, is still a pretty big hassle just to experience everything the game has to offer. I love a lot of things about Black 2 and White 2, but the key system is not one of them. In Gen 6, specifically Pokemon X and Y, a few under-the-radar changes were made to fishing. Of course, most notably, the consecutive fishing feature was added as a shiny hunting method, where you would fish in the same spot over and over and over again, and each encounter would build a chain that raises the chance of finding a shiny Pokemon. To aid players fiddling around with this new feature, another adjustment was made in the process. If you fish directly in front of a rock or an area enclosed by them, then the odds of hooking a Pokemon will be significantly higher. Furthermore, although this is not a Gen 6 exclusive feature, this could stack with the Pokemon ability Suction Cups and Sticky Hold, which also increase the odds of ruling in a Pokemon. 
Curiously, chain fishing did not return as a mechanic in Gen 7, but Gen 8 would bring back a variation of it where fishing at the same spot over and over again will increase the odds of finding a shiny. In Gen 7, there are a few different features that allow you to unlock exceedingly rare Pokémon in the wild. Of course, everyone knows about SOS encounters, where a wild Pokémon will call upon an ally for help, but only a few species that use this will lead to extraordinary results. First, there's the Bagon on Route 3, who has a slim chance of calling in a Salamence between levels 9 and 12 for help. And yes, you can catch this, making it the lowest leveled pseudo-legendary you can legitimately obtain in any Pokémon game. Eat your heart out, Lance. On Route 4, while the Eevee can even call for Espeon or Umbreon to aid them, depending on the time of day, some allies that show up aren't even allies, hilariously. Carbink can accidentally call in Sableye, which will target the Carbink before it turns its attention to you. The new Pokémon Marini can only appear in the wild through this method, being called upon by its very prey, Corsola. Given Corsola's extremely low encounter rate and the slim chance of it calling for help, Marini is certainly one of the hardest new Pokémon to find in any game. In Generation 8, a few new features were introduced to help differentiate Pokémon a bit more. First is the addition of marks and titles. Depending on conditions, roughly 5-10% to of all wild Pokémon will have a mark relating to one of their unique characteristics, but some marks are rarer than others. There is actually a mark programmed into the game that is currently unobtainable, known as the Destiny Mark, with the corresponding title being the Chosen One. There is also an item known as the Mark Charm, which to be completely honest, I had no clue even existed until researching it for this video, which triples the chance of finding a Pokémon with a Mark. The only way to obtain this item is to complete the Isle of Armor Pokédex, similar to how one would obtain the Shiny Charm. Speaking of Shiny Pokémon, a new type of Shiny Sparkle was introduced in this generation, the Square Sparkle, which is meant to only appear on one out of every 16 Shiny Pokémon, making it an exceptionally rare type of Shiny. However, due to the way the game calculates personality values, this rate is inverted for wild encounters, making square sparkles occur 15 out of 16 times. So basically, regular sparkle for a wild encounter is now considered rare, but the square sparkle is rarer for hatched Pokémon, or Pokémon obtained as gifts from NPCs. It's kind of a mess, but a little bit cool if you obtain the rarer version of a shiny, and it has a mark of some kind. In a way, it's like they were trying to revitalize the feeling of finding an extremely rare Pokémon by adding these new tiers of rarity in Gen 8. And that's gonna do it for today's video, thank you so very much for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, 85% of people who watch these videos are not subscribed, so make sure you do that, and leave a like if you enjoyed. I'll see you guys next time.